Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help members of the military community thrive in their post-service career and life. Today's episode number 447, Life After Being Declared Killed in Action with Justin Constantine. As you said, you have to do the work on the front end. Just like anything we did in the military, you, you have to take agency of that. And so that means thinking by yourself or with your family or your loved one or whoever it is around you, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Why do I want to do that? And how do I get there? And if I don't know the answers to those, I need to find a mentor or look online and get those answers. So then when I run into someone, I can give them a very succinct description, like you said, now that person can think in their head, okay, I know John or I know Susie there, I know Colleen, but otherwise, I haven't done the, I haven't done my homework and I'm really not positioning myself for success. Today's episode originally aired on in June of 2019. This last week, I learned that Justin passed away following a battle with cancer. I wanted to rebroadcast today's episode as a tribute to both Justin's life and legacy. What to say about Justin? Well, he was shot in the head by a sniper and pronounced killed in action, but that didn't stop him. Justin was a Purple Heart recipient, an author, a lawyer, a motivational speaker, an entrepreneur, and worked with a company that helps over 24,000 military members and their families every single month find their ideal job and make their career transitions easier. It's a little disappointing to be on a show with two Justins and realize that the other Justin is kicking some serious ass and you need to try to do your best to keep up. Um, I really enjoyed my time with Justin and the little bit that I got to know him. Very, very sorry for his loss and very grateful for the role model he was, the human he was, the husband, the father, um, and the veteran he was. So with that, please enjoy my conversation with Justin. Well, joining me today from New York is Justin Constantine. Justin, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Yeah, thanks so much, Justin, for having me. It's it's an honor here. I'm really looking forward to the time to talk with you. Oh, I'm I'm really honored to have you on the show, Justin. Uh, you know, as listeners heard in your bio, you've just had a a wealth of experience, and I know that listeners are going to learn a lot from hearing your story. Um, We always start off with kind of the same question, which is. Uh, what your transition was like from the military to the civilian workforce. And you have a a really unique situation, but I'm wondering, like, what would you want listeners to know about um, what that transition was like for you? Yeah, now I focus, because of the work I do, I know we'll get to it later, I focus a lot on transition and and then veteran and military staff's employment. Uh, so I'm very much aware of the issues. I, it's something I work very closely with. But when, and I faced some of those challenges when I first left active duty back in 2004, finding I thought I had a great resume. I had been a Marine Corps lawyer, tons of trial experience. I thought any company would be lucky to have me, but I really didn't know how to market myself looking back on it. Um, Ultimately, I took a job uh, as a counsel with ICE at the Department of Homeland Security. That was only because I, I was in the Marine Corps. I met a guy in the Army doing some joint training over in Korea when I had been stationed in Okinawa. We loosely kept in touch. He took my resume and gave it to his boss there, who was in charge of the whole department, who also was an officer in the Army Reserves. But I So then they brought me in for an interview and hired me. But I had applied for... 30 or 40 civilian positions, probably cold, got rejected from all of them. And, and my only learning point from that was start early and then really using, and this is nothing groundbreaking, really using network. But, you know, they say 70% of jobs are by personal recommendation. They're not just by saying in cold call resumes. Every that position and everyone I've had since then is because of a friend I knew at that agency or in that department who I was able to talk with and work with, and they took my resume to someone, the hiring manager there. So the biggest thing I know it can be a challenge for folks who are still in to get out there and start networking, but it really is critical. And now, ten years later, twelve years later, there's a lot more online um, resources for that, LinkedIn, etc and a lot more people out there trying to facilitate that. Mm. And, and I think it's great for listeners to hear that, you know, you applying to 30 to 40 jobs. Yeah. I mean, it's not as simple as I think so many people yeah. expect it's like, I'm going to apply to a job and get it. And it's, it's everything is a numbers game. Um, and I, I think it's great to hear that. And I think it's also awesome that you're highlighting 
the importance of networking. And, and one question I have on that, for yeah. some reason, I don't know if this matches your experience, for some reason when I talk to people in the military, there's like an aversion to network. Networking is like a, a dirty word. It seems like slimy. And I'm wondering if you have any advice on how someone might approach networking in a way that feels authentic or, or how to network even. Yeah, thank you. I, I do have some good thoughts on that. Uh, in fact, you know, I wrote a book last year on veteran employment that was published by the Society for Human Resource Management, which is the largest HR association out there. And I included a whole section in there on networking because it was written for HR professionals. Each chapter I included information for transitioning service members and veterans and military spouses. And the big part was networking. But you're right, Justin, this is a a tough subject. We think we're not used to it. And I say we think we're not because we actually have been doing it during our time in the military. For instance, uh, I had a, I had a, someone at my rank or one rank higher who I work with who was our um, designator or whatever you want to call it, our career. I can't remember the exact word. It's different in each service. But the person we went to who helped us where, where our next position was going to be, our duty station and what we were going to do that was networking when I talked with him or her to, to tell them where I wanted to go and why. And for instance, when I was in Okinawa, I wasn't exactly thrilled to be there, frankly. Looking back, it was a great duty station at the time. I, I didn't appreciate it. And I heard from my um, designator that I was next going to go to Camp Lejeune. Well, I didn't want to do that. Uh, I was uh, single, and the last place I wanted to go was down to you know, North, Jacksonville, North Carolina. I wanted to go to the West Coast. And I talked to my boss, Lieutenant Colonel. I said, ma'am, can you please call one of your friends at the Pentagon and see if they can help? They did. I ended up going to Camp Pendleton. That was, that was great. That was networking. You know, I, I leveraged the relationship I had. She trusted me. I had done great work for her, so it wasn't a risk. And I just identified something I needed, and she helped me out. That was networking. That's going on all the time, whether you're talking to a colleague or someone a couple ranks higher than you on what school you should go to, if they can help you get in here, what, what's next on your horizon. And, and so we're already used to it, is my point. We just don't look at it the way we think of in the corporate world where it's networking. But networking is not just about, I think the problem is people think networking is you're going hat in hand with your hands out asking for a favor. And that's not what it is. It's developing friendships and relationships Putting yourself out there where you're saying, what can I do for you? I mean, I help people on a daily basis, not, not because uh, for any reason, except I know it's good. I believe what comes around goes around, and I want to see people around me do well. I know the people around me want to see me do well, too, so I don't mind asking them. And if I say, hey, um, I heard there's this event. Can you help get me in? Or, hey, my friend's looking for a job up here. Can you take a look at his resume? That's networking. That's just reaching out, and it's, it's – not cold it's based on a relationship so when someone says let's go to a networking event that's nothing to be scared of it's you know what if i can go there and make make two or three new relationships explain who i am in a 30 second elevator pitch and someone's like hey connect with me on linkedin or follow up or let's stay in touch or i know a guy success mission success go home make sure you follow up and it goes from there but it's not slimy it's not um, you know, I'm trying to corner you and make you feel guilty and do something for me. It, it, as long as you're doing it for others and making sure, you know, a, a, a rising, they say a, a rising tide lifts all boats, as long as that's your mentality, helping others, networking is actually going to be something you enjoy doing. I really like it now. I love introducing people to other people and see them succeed. So much I want to tease out of that. I think that you're, you're, you're dispensing a lot of wisdom here. First of all, I love how you point out like this is this is nothing new i think anyone in the military that you've done this you've done this of like hey you know your friend is being stationed somewhere new you know someone else there you connect them like you right. have done this and i think that most people who serve in the military they have a strong desire to give back to help and so know that you're already doing that and and i love that you also um pointed out that like like you enjoy this you enjoy helping people and yeah. And Justin's not a no, alone on this. I think almost everyone loves to help. Um, Scott Davidson connected Justin and I. It was like, you know, it, it helps me 
because I get an incredible guest. It helps Justin by giving him a platform. Scott gets to feel good about connecting us. That that's networking. You know, everyone is getting something out of this. And and the other thing that I wanted to to highlight that you said was you said at these network events you have your elevator pitch. And I just want to add that in. I think that's such a great piece of advice for listeners is um, assume that people want to help you, but make it easy for them to help you. Like, you know, the example I think of is if someone comes to me and says, hey, I'm a veteran. I'm like, okay, great. I want to help you. And then they say, I'm looking for another job. And I think, great, I want to help you. And they say, I'll go anywhere and do anything. And I, I am a blank now. There's no way on earth I can help you. Versus if you said, hey, Justin, I'm a veteran, I'm looking for a new job, I want to go into the health and fitness space, I'm hoping to live in San Francisco, it's a company that's 50 to 100 employees, that's yeah. uh, got a great culture, I can work with that. I can, I can literally start rolling through my mental Rolodex, or I can, be, you know, I can look online. So if you have that elevator pitch, if you take the time and it does take time. If you take the time to work on it, refine it, and get it succinct, I can, you know, I and anyone else can work with that. So I think that that's great, Justin, that you're calling that out, the importance of having that elevator pitch and doing the work for the other person. Well, you know, you're actually right because I, I kind of get tired of seeing uh, on LinkedIn or other threads where veterans say, oh, no, no one wants to talk to me. No one wants to help. Um, this is this is the worst experience of my life. So transition is hard. I, I, I've been through a lot of transition, such as being shot. I know that. But as you said, you have to do the work on the front end. Just like anything we did in the military, you, you have to take agency of, of that. And so that means thinking by yourself or with your family or your loved one or whoever it is around you, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Why do I want to do that? And how do I get there? And if I don't know the answers to those, I need to find a mentor or look online and, and get those answers. So then when I run into someone, I can give them a very succinct description, like you said. Now that person can think in their head, okay, I know John or I know Susie there, I know Colleen. But otherwise, I haven't done, a, I haven't done my homework and I, I'm really not positioning myself for success. So we have to own it. We have to know it takes time and preparation, just like planning a budget takes time and thought. So there's the next stage of your life. It's, it's, it's great that you say that. I love I loved the word that you used on that agency. I think that's such yeah. a great word. Um, it's something I have a tough time putting my finger on because on the one hand, in my experience, people in the military, you, you drop them in somewhere and they will overcome incredible obstacles right. to achieve a mission. So they are, they are fully capable of doing anything. And at the same time, there's a lot of aspects of our life in the military that train us to be dependent. I'm going to be told when to go right. to get my dental checkup. I'm going to be told to do That's these right. things. I'm going to be given training to teach. So like it's, it's this conflict between like right. extreme agency and extreme dependence. And the number one complaint I have is that People get out of the military, they're told you're going to be given a great job, and they're disappointed when that doesn't happen. And what I love about what you're saying with agency is like, it's almost like, can you adopt a mindset of nothing is going to happen unless I make it happen? I am not going to get a job unless I make that happen. And, and what I love about what you were saying too is like, hey, you can use yourself, your spouse, your family, find mentors, find all these great organizations. Like, but the onus is on you to make that happen and then use those resources to figure out what you want and go after it. But it all comes down to you. No one else is going to do it. That's exactly right. And we're, we're lucky in the military. Immediately, you're surrounded, whether you're you know, whether it's a gunnery sergeant or a captain or, or someone or, or, or your team leader, whoever it is, who's kind of pushing you, like you said, you're getting notifications to do things. That's just, that's nice. We have that. And that serves us well when we go overseas and combat is critical. But that's not how the rest of the world works. And if you're not um, pushing yourself, uh, then, then you're just, you're going to have a tough time. The thing is, you already done way harder stuff. Than, than what you're being asked to do now. You just have to retrain your mind to say, this is a new mission. I may not, I may not know everything that's involved, but there's so many people out there who want to help me. I can succeed. That changes your mindset on that thing. 
I love, I love that too. The thought of like changing your mindset. It, 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 it is, it is, um, there's a, a quote that I love about entrepreneurship. It's, it's, it's 90% psychology, 10% skills. And yeah. to me, it just speaks to like the incredible role that our mindset plays. And that's what I think is most exciting for listeners, whether you're, you've been out for 10 years or whether you're not transitioning for another 10 years out of the military is like, you have got this. You have everything it's going to take to be successful. But if you're going to spend time on something, start to change that mindset of, you know, hey, I'm going to be dropped behind enemy lines on the civilian side of things. I have a new mission, unknown landscape, and I have to adapt to achieve my new mission. And my new mission is all about what I want for me and for my family. And I'll challenge listeners, that's going to be uh, uh, a speed bump for you. You're probably great at thinking of what's best for your unit, for the military, for your country. But I think one of the big shifts I've seen is once you take out that uniform, you have to prioritize yourself and your family and what you want. And that might be, that might be one of the bigger transitions you face. Yeah, that, that, that's for sure. That's true. I spend a lot of my time talking with HR professionals about uh, help them hire veterans and military spouses. And one thing we talk about is the interview. And I say, look, if, if, this, if this service member, if this is a transition service member or a new veteran and they haven't been out in the private sector for a while, I guarantee you they're going to have trouble talking about themselves the same way that you're used to with other folks who are making a lateral move from another private sector job. And I say you have to really peel back the onion. You have to ask them some questions because they've been trained. If they say, what did you do in this? What did you do in Iraq? He's going to say, I was a truck driver. He's not going to say, he doesn't know to tell you I led eight people. I was responsible for two trucks. I went on a hundred missions. I got this award. People in the private sector are tripping over themselves to, to brag about themselves that way. We don't come from that background. That's great in our culture. But once you transition, as you transition, you have to, it's not bragging. It's, it's empowering that, that person across from you to make a good decision in hiring you. I, I love that shift in mindset too. It's not bragging. It's about empowering the other person. Like, it's like, yeah. if you don't, you know, that, what, that example you gave is so great. It's like, if you just say yeah. you're a truck driver, you're actually making it harder for the person sitting across for you. But like, paint that picture. You're leading eight people. You're doing logistics and planning and all these things. And, and these things that Justin is talking about, this is not something you do on the fly in the moment of an interview. This is something that you, just like you practice shooting a firearm, this is something that you practice and you practice and you practice so that in game day, nothing new is coming out of your mouth. This is a, re, you know, you've done the dress rehearsal, you're showing up and you're able to effectively tell them, this is what I did in terms you would understand. That's right. In, in the book I wrote, it was called From We Will to At Will. Um, in there, again, it was written for HR professionals, but each chapter had guidance for vets and spouses. And so on the chapter about how to interview vets, um, I included for the for the service members and the veterans a bunch of questions that they should, typical questions they may be asked, they should be prepared to answer. And I don't know, there was 10 or 20 of those questions. But like you said, they, 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 your listeners should be prepared to answer questions in, in greater detail than we're used to and, and calmly and in a casual information. So I understand in the military, if you're expected to dress up, so put on dress uniform and come sit across the table from someone, it's probably not a good day. Something bad probably happens and you're in trouble. <laughs> but in, you know, if you're going to an interview, Pretend you're talking to your uncle or, or, or a good friend or something, because that's, that's where they're coming from. It's not Sir and Man. They're saying, hey, Justin, hey, Tom, you know, tell me a little bit about your background. If you don't know those answers of what you did, what your responsibilities are, leadership opportunities you had, how your experience translates over to the specific job you're interviewing for, then you're really not setting yourself up for success. And like I said in the book, there's 10 or 20 of those questions, and you can probably find those online too. But when we, before we deployed to Iraq, we did emergency action drills hundreds of times. So we knew what to do in, in those, those instances where something may happen. Same here, be prepared. That's such a great analogy too. It's like, okay, you, you plan, this happens, how do I respond? 
and you plan and you practice and practice until that response is instinctive. Yeah. And um, what I like to think about too is, is when you're in that interview setting, if you've prepared, you know, you've looked at those list of questions in Justin's book, you've prepared, you know, when they ask this, I'm going to tell the story. You've prepared, yeah. you've practiced it, you've rehearsed it. Now, when you're in the interview, you don't have to spend your brain power thinking of how to answer the question. You can think about connecting with them as a person. You can think about the finer details rather than what am I going to say. And um, yeah, I think that's really powerful. I, I want to ask you a couple more detailed questions, but let me take a step back and say, if you bumped into someone from active duty today and they said, hey, Justin, what do you do for a living? H how do you answer that question? Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I focus on two things. I'm a, I'm a lawyer by background, but I practiced for 15 years. And then in 2013, left that. My last job was at the FBI on the counterterrorism team. But I left that and started my own business as a motivational seeker. So I do that. And I've been doing that. Uh, I seek to large corporations and universities. But really, 90% of my time is on the chief business development officer at JobPath which is the most robust veteran employment platform in the country. So I spend my days uh, connecting with uh, large, medium, and small companies and encouraging them to use our platform. We bring on 24,000 vets and spouses every single month. So we are very robust. So as I said, I spend my time uh, meeting with large companies and, and medium and small ones, uh, explaining to them why they should be using our platform and also educating them on why they should hire veterans. So let's maybe start with the second piece then, the 90% of yeah. your work at JobFest. Um, I mean, you've helped, an, an, I mean, the numbers are incredible, 24,000 vets and spouses every month. That's just insane. Um, what are things that employers, I, I'm wondering if like, do you have a sense for an employer, what do they have wrong about vets? Like when they think of a veteran, they're thinking of one thing and a veteran's another thing. What are some of those disconnects? And I ask that for listeners to be able to, you know, understand that so they can find ways to break them out of that habit or, or show them that, you know, that they're different than their expectations. Yeah, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that we have a civ mill divide in this country, civilian military divide. Not, you know, it actually comes from a good place. I think that HR professionals are nervous. Of, they don't have much experience talking about us. Most of them are civilians. I think they're intimidated by our, our backgrounds. They're not. They don't want to. They don't want to um, ask us the wrong question. They don't want to sound disrespectful because they are very respectful. Um, left, right, and center of, of where uh, of what we've done. They don't want to look silly because they're not used to it, perhaps, hiring veterans. Maybe their boss said, we're hiring 100 veterans this year. And they're like, oh, great. I'm already busy. Now what does that mean? I don't even know what the MOS is. What am I supposed to do? On the other side, I think our veterans are, are – are not sure how to describe what they did in the service in civilian terms and using the right buzzwords and key phrases that civilians understand. They can talk to their friends all day long about what they did, what they've done together, but they get nervous talking to folks in the private sector. So there is this divide. And, and, and so you said, what, what should they know? Um, what's going on? What are HR professionals thinking? And I believe there's a few myths out there. One is that, and I talked, for instance, um, earlier this week, I was at the National Talent Conference for SHRM, Society for HR Managers, and I gave a presentation. And my last slide was five myths around veterans in the workplace. And one is that veteran or service members are only good at taking orders. And so I think there is this stereotype where from movies or maybe – General Patton is up there and says, take the hill or something. And they think we just are mindless drones and minions who can only do or told. So I spend time saying, no, we push responsibility down to the lowest level possible, down to our sergeants and corporals who we entrust in the critical decisions in the blink of an eye. If someone has served four years and it's coming now to you, they've already uh, had leadership training and your tax dollars paid for. They're used to taking initiative. They're used to teamwork. Of course, they can take orders, but we don't micromanage in the military. We give a commander's intent, maybe. We show the way forward. We let others make those decisions, and we don't walk behind them in the little clipboard. So 
that's something that I think is important for service members to stress is that they're used to making decisions and don't just rely, they don't need a manager following them around all day long because I think managers are nervous that they're going to have to give orders all day. They don't want to do that. Uh, another thing I talk about, which may not be re so relevant here, is that I educate about PTSD mm. because studies show that HR professionals are concerned about PTSD in the veteran workforce, even though they really don't know what PTSD is. They may not have ever met anyone with PTSD. They just, because of Rambo and movies like that, they associate it with veterans and a broken veteran and something that's gone terribly wrong. And so I use myself as an example. I said, look, I was shot in the head in Iraq. I had something traumatic happen to me. I have PTSD. I went to counseling for a year and a half, weekly counseling one-on-one. -on -one. I'm far more resilient now than, than probably anyone else in your company. And by the way, maybe, and they say 20% of us returning service members from Iraq and Afghanistan have PTSD. That's 500,000. Across our country, actually, 24 million Americans have PTSD from things that happen every day, like car accidents and natural disasters and rape and sexual assault, violent assaults, mur you know, seeing a murder, seeing a dead body, growing up in a bad neighborhood. Those things happen by the thousands across our country every day. And so I said, you're already used to working for and with people who have PTSD. You just don't hear about it in the news. And so... That's not something that's going to come up in an interview because they can't ask about that. But I do think we should all be aware of these statistics as veterans and try to change the discussion when we can offline to destigmatize PTSD because it's unfortunate that people who are looking to hire us have this in the back of their heads. That, that's great. I, I never heard that before but when you yeah. say that that's great it's like you know 20 you know half a million veterans with PTSD, PTSD that's that's a drop in the bucket compared to the 24 million yeah. Americans it's not yeah. it's not as prominent and um, you know where my mind goes with this is I, I love that first example and I, I think that's probably true where people assume oh you're just an order taker and so for listeners it's kind of like Get your strategy together to combat even both of these. So for the first one, you know, I, I would think of, okay, there's a story that I could tell in an interview where my captain on my submarine said, hey, um, the discrepancy log for, your, for our equipment is not being utilized properly and we have to keep equipment safe and sound or we're going to sink. And that was the extent of information I was given. And then I had to go and I had to meet with the different managers, AKA the senior enlisted. And I had to pull them and figure out what wasn't going wrong. And I had to go and talk to all the team members and figure this out. And I had to try it. Like I would tell a story where I was given very limited information and had to go and accomplish the mission. Because what I'm doing is I'm subconsciously contradicting their expectation of, oh, Justin must have just been told what to do and how to do it. I'm showing through a story that that's no longer true. And I would even yeah. say, you know, just shooting from the hip here on the PTSD side, you know, maybe, maybe the, the person sitting across from you has this fear that you have PTSD, or maybe, you know, maybe a little bit more broadly, a stereotype is people from the military are not empathetic and they're very, very mean. Well, yeah. I could show maybe maybe I do volunteering with Habitat for Humanity when I'm on shore, or maybe I go and I volunteer in a certain setting. Well, of course, I'm doing good in the world, but I'm also showing, hey, I, I've worked with other civilians. I'm doing things that are empathetic. I'm doing things that are caring. And so if you know the, the false perception they have, you can think of how you want to combat that, how you want to provide counter evidence to refute that. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And um, I do agree with you. Like, you should be able to tell a story because you're going to get a question. Tell me about a time when X, Y, Z, like what, when you faced a leadership challenge, when you overcame something significant, when, when you had to do something you weren't sure how to do. You're going to get that question because that's what they're dealing with in the workforce. So be prepared to answer that and have a nice story ready. But uh, one last one, because the PTSD doesn't really help for an interview, but um, – only 14% of uh, MOSs are combat related. So I think a perception also is on the private, in the private sector is that everyone is an American sniper. Everyone is on the tip, you know, pointy tip of the sphere. They don't recognize that 
86 percent of positions are have direct civilian correlations that we have cooks and IT specialists and recruiters lawyers doctors engineers marketers you know all those so the, the better you are at talking about what you did and how it not only uh, directly applies to the position you're, hired, you're applying for, which you have to know cold, but how also it, it's out there in the private sector. You're not reinventing the wheel here. Like, yeah, I was in, um, I was an admin clerk uh, at, at Camp Allen for four years. You know, I, I use this software and this software. I know it's the same one you use at XYZ company. I'm used on a daily basis. I would work with senior level folks and my colleagues and, and making sure that they were getting paid on time and any of the ministry of concerns were taken care of. Well, that's what, that's what the private sector wants to see too. So they're thinking, oh, you're in the military, you're, you're out there as a sniper and we hopefully don't need that in our company. But the reality is you were probably doing something. And even if you were a sniper, you have leadership skills you can talk about and, and those sorts of things, soft skills. So be prepared to characterize what you did in civilian terms. I think that's so great. And, and to tease something out for our listeners too on that, I love when you were saying like, hey, I use the same software you do. It's a short yeah. sentence, but um, that communicates to me, this person's done their homework. Like if I'm the hiring manager, I'm like, okay, great. This person understands what I do. Um, in in an episode I'll, I'll link to in the show notes, I give an example for consulting interviews where it was like thinking, okay, what does a consultant do? A consultant analyzes a problem, they come up with a solution and they sell it to a company. And so I, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'm like, okay, great. And I use that same example I was talking about with Justin earlier about, okay, my captain gave me this problem. I met with the crew on multiple meetings. I gained information and then I had to sell it to the crew because guess what? If I just told my crew of 180 submariners that to do something, they're not going to just do it. They're smart. They're capable. I had to sell this to them. I had to show them it was going to work. And that's, guess what? That's exactly what a consultant does. So in, in Justin's quick example there, he was, he was giving you a great framework of do the research to understand what they need and then showcase how your background does that. And I guarantee your background relates to a variety of these things. And it's, yeah. just, it's just a matter of doing the, the homework to figure out how to explain it. Yeah, I would say if you're not doing the homework, if you don't know a lot about that company when you're going in to uh, apply there, you don't deserve that job. And you're going to show them that you're not prepared. If you don't care enough to learn about them and convincing them to pay you a lot of money to come work there, you're, you're not committed to that. And that's going to show. Yep. And I love that too. I love that, that statement of like, you. this is something to earn. This is something that you're not going to be given. And it's Again, it's something people have done so often in the military. Like you had to, whatever you ended up doing, you had to put some sort of effort to do that. And whatever you accomplished, you had to really do the heavy lifting to, to, to work out and to get muscles. You have to do the reps. You can't, there's no way around it. And what you're describing is exactly that. Well, if you were a corporal and went before the uh, promotion board for sergeant and you didn't study and have your knowledge and be in good shape and know exactly how to answer questions and how to look squared away in uniform, you wouldn't get promoted. You, but you, of course you're going to do that. That's your mindset. Like, I know I have to do this. Same now. I know I have to do this. So go do it. That's great. Is there, um, are there any other mistakes that you see veterans doing in your work? I know we've kind of covered a lot of them, but I want to just make room, given the wealth of experience you have here, anything else you want to make sure let, uh, listeners know about um, the job process or even identifying what they want to do when they get out of the military? Yeah, uh, well, a couple of things, you know, the statistics show that uh, 50, 50 percent. Veterans, half of them want to do what they used to do in the military, the same thing along the lines of the MOS, and half don't. And, and that's fine. There's no right answer on that. Um, but you should take the time. Let me back up. We also see that I think it's like 60 or 65 percent of veterans leave their first job within six months. That, that's, a, that's a tough statistic, and I think that's because they probably weren't a good fit for that position. I think the employer maybe didn't do their homework and maybe didn't hire the right person. I also think that transition service member took a job maybe out of a sense of, um, I, need, I just need to work, I need to take any job I can get. Uh, I didn't wait, I didn't prepare in time, so now I'm, I'm leaving the front gate, I need money coming in, what can I do? And so they haven't spent the time probably thinking about where they want to go, uh, what that next step is. 
I mean, and I mean that professionally and geographically and professionally and all that. And they haven't put in the right, they haven't done research on that company because no one wants to go to a company and work there for six months and then go somewhere else. Because now on your resume, it shows you are maybe a job hopper or, or you didn't, you know, you, you, you didn't stay there for some reason. And, and why would you want to go and have to go through the whole interview process again and start over and, and all that? We, no one really wants that. So I, I've seen that happen and I think it's, um, because they're not preparing themselves. I, I fully understand when you're, when you're transitioning out, it can be confusing uh, navigating that, but there's a lot of groups out there. I can talk about what we do at Job Path to make that easier. Uh, there are other groups out there as well, of course, but take advantage of them. And I want to get into the work that you do at Job, job Path in, in a second. I just want to say that um, th- those numbers are pretty, pretty crazy. And, and on that first one, I think it's great to see, you know, 50% want to do the same thing that they did in the military. I think that, you know, Justin, you're a great example in this, though, because like, I think it's like, man, you had uh, a significant experience in the legal field. So in my mind, I'm like, well, of course, he's going to get out and be a lawyer. And that's certainly a path that's open to people. But if you don't want to do that, you know, you can do anything. Justin started his own company. He's joined a company. He's, he's doing incredible work. And so don't let what you did in the military define what you're going to do out of the military. There's clearly advantages if you have career capital built up in a certain skill set. But I would, I would say it's even more important. Did you enjoy that? Do you want to do that? Because the sky's the limit. You can switch. It may take a lot of work to go from being some specific skill set in the military and then doing something completely different. You can do it if you're willing to put in the effort to bridge that gap. But it's, um, it's, it's helpful to have those numbers to realize that not everyone wants to do the same work that they did in the military. Oh, yeah, it's fine. And frankly, a lot of people are probably doing something in the military they don't really want to do. They were, they were assigned that. Um, Say you were in logistics, and maybe you don't want to do that, or a truck driver or something. These are all critical positions in the military, but maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you, you see that IT is, you like computers, you like coding, and, and you have a mind that way. Well, there's all sorts of opportunities where you can go for, use your GI Bill or not, maybe an eight-week course, and you're going to get a $50,000 job. That, those are out there. There's tons of those out there. Or you go back to college, or you do a one-year certification program with Cisco, whatever it is. And this is just one example. Those opportunities are out there, and then you're off to the races. So whatever field you think you may be interested in, you can, you can as you said, Justin, you can make that lateral move. You've already learned great experience in the military that is very valuable across all industries. And, and I, I want to talk about uh, the 10%, the entrepreneur, the writer, the motivational speaker. But before we move on, um, what do you want listeners to know a, about Job Path? What's a way that they could get in, engaged with the work that you're doing? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So our URL at Job Path is actually yourjobpath.com. And like I said, we bring on 24,000 users every month. We, we have, it was actually, I've been there a year and a half. It was started six years ago by civilians. But I, I used to consult with Hiring Our Heroes and then also with military.com. And I really love Job Path and I'm proud to be there because it's a tech company at its core that focuses on veterans and military spouses. So we have cutting edge technology that no one else, no one else has. Resources that were created for HR professionals, civilians, to make it easy for them to understand and connect with veterans. And that's a critical difference in what we do. We also believe that veterans shouldn't have to go to six different sites to find what they need. They shouldn't have to log on all over the place. So if you come to yourjobpath.com, you'll be able to create resumes there. You'll have, we have a very robust mentorship platform with thousands of people on there. Um, and on that mentorship platform, you can connect and then communicate by video or text chat or email or in person, however you want. We have 250 training courses and, and all sorts of business and soft skills that you can take to which electronically attached to your resume so civilians can see, okay, he does have these skills that we're looking for. Uh, he may not have got, he or she may not have got them in the military, but they've taken these classes. We also have the only transition dashboard and mobile app where you, once you create a profile, answering seven questions, your name, rank, uh, what branch you're in, your zip code, 
you know, your date of your, your, your when you transition out and your rank, you answer those questions every day. And we have 1,600 companies that we work with. Every day, um, you'll receive an updated list of the companies within your zip code that you pick within whatever you want, 25, 50, 100 miles, based on your MOS and or the career interests that you selected that you're interested in because we know half of them don't want that. So every day you get in, on your mobile app or in your email a list of the job openings that are available. You just can hit click to apply. Also, uh, by your zip code, what the GI Bill is in your area. And so you can compare zip codes around the country if that's important to you. A link to the VA's healthcare system since all transition service members are eligible for five years of free healthcare at the VA. And also, and this doesn't exist anywhere else, a comprehensive list of every certification and certificate that you may be eligible for based on what you did in the military. Quick example is in the Army, uh, 88 Mike is a truck driver. They probably never learn in TAP because TAP is a tough, a tough, <laughs> our transition program doesn't work the way we would like to see it work, I guess I could say. Um, so no individualized attention on different MOSs they probably don't learn that they have one because they were a truck driver in the army or the other branches. They can go get their CEL license in the, in the, on the state level for free within one month, within one year. If they don't do it within one year, it probably costs around ten thousand dollars to do that. So if someone indicates uh, they put in their MOS, we know they're a truck driver. The computer automatically sends them a notification every month, counting down. You've got ten months. You've got eight months. You've got three months to get your CEL. They click on that button. It takes them to their state DMV. They click for the form. They fill it out, click on the next button, print it out. They just got to take it down to DMV and get their license. That license is good forever. They may not need it right then because say maybe they're going to school, but maybe over the winter break, they need some extra money. Well, they can go drive a, drive a truck for two weeks, make a couple thousand dollars, go back to school. That's just one quick example. So all that's available there. That's why I'm so proud of it because it is a one-stop shop. Our resumes are, are um, guaranteed to work with any applicant tracking system. Those are the systems that companies use to parse your resume electronically before it goes to a recruiter. Because we're a tech company, we focus on that. Other groups don't even know to do that. So you'll never hear from us. Uh, I, I sent my resume in, but I never heard back. I never got anywhere. But that probably happened because there's some technical reasons but it didn't get to the recruiter, it didn't get to the company. Ours never had a problem. So we're, we're thrilled about what we do. We have HR uh, resources as well. Your folks are more interested in what we do for veterans and spouses. It's all free for veterans and their family members. And for listeners, I'm going to put in the show notes, uh, yourjobpath.com. I've been taking notes on all of these things. So you'll have a summary there as well. I just want to say that, um, you know, one of the more, more common pain points that I hear of for people in the military and veterans is, um, there's like, you know, there's so many resources out there. How do I keep track of it? So there's a lot of what you just said that resonates. But the biggest thing for me is like all of these things in one spot. You know, it's not like piecemeal. It's not like you have to go to one site for this, one site for that. It is one comprehensive solution. And I love that fact of, um, there, there, I forget the stat. It's like there's over 20,000 nonprofits to help veterans. Like there's so many things out there to help people. It's, it's impossible to know what all of them are, but I love this idea, you know, enter in your MOS and it's like, hey, did you know you are qualifying for this? It's, it's a system that's using, uh, doing the heavy lifting for you to figure out how to help you. That's exactly right. You know, we have a heavy emphasis on AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Last year, that's why last year we helped place over 16,000 vets. So when they come there, uh, you know, you, we make it as easy as possible for them. Also on the resumes, uh, on their profile, we include rank, which very few other, if any other groups do too, because your MOS is one thing, but what you did as a corporal is a lot different than what you did as a master sergeant or as a lieutenant to lieutenant colonel. Your responsibilities change, you progress over time. So just like in the private sector, if I was in financial services, I wouldn't just say financial services. After 20 years, I would say, you know, I have my title involved. So we include ranks so people see your responsibilities have grown, you've been promoted, and what that means. And so our resumes are easy to, to create. There's a lot of out of populated language. Uh, we, we've modified it to make it easy. You can add MOSs, you can add certificates you've received, awards, stuff like that. So 
again, very easy to use. As you said, it's all under one roof and we already have 1600 companies we're, we're working with and probably about 10 other organizations that have white labeled our software. And so why that is significant is say you're coming, say you're part of Paralyzed Veterans of America or Air Force Association or Blue Star Families or Hope for the Warriors, you're using our software on the back end, so you're coming into our pool, so our employers will see you, and you'll see all the jobs that are all available through whatever channel you came in or your friend came in, whether it was Job Pass, Air Force Association, whatever. So we're all playing for the same sheet of music. You're seeing all those opportunities out there, and all the employers from the different avenues are seeing you as well. That, that's what's so powerful about it. That's great. That's really exceptional. Yeah. And, I, and I wanted to ask about the 10%. Could you talk about yeah. the process of starting your own company and what that has been like? Yeah, that was really exciting. So I, I didn't you know, grow up thinking I want to be a motivational speaker. Obviously, it's based on being shot in Iraq and having a very fortunate recovery. Uh, thanks to Corman George Grant, my wife, Dahlia, and, and hundreds of other people, frankly. Um, but it was... I was shot in 06. I started getting asked, probably 08 or 09, to seek at like Marine Corps birthday balls or different events just, as a, just to come and talk for 15 minutes. And it was about then, or a couple of years later, I realized, you know, maybe people would pay for something like this. And so I started reaching out to companies and, it's, you know, started small. One big piece of advice I would say to entrepreneurs I did not leave my day job. So I was still working full time as a lawyer whether it was on Capitol Hill or the FBI, I got permission to do this on the side. So I had my paycheck coming in. I spent my daytime on that. And that way I could grow my business. And it wasn't like if I didn't get a certain job that month, I was going to fail. And so I gave myself a nice safety net. And then in 2013, I realized I grow my business enough. I can do this full time and I'll be fine. One thing people, I started talking a lot about leadership and overcoming adversity, dealing with change. These are all important to the private sector. These are things I can speak authoritatively about. A lot of people ask me, have you written a book? Have you written a book? And so I did write a book on leadership. Uh, My Battlefield, Your Office is the name of it. Um, I don't know, I probably sold three or 4,000 copies, but that's a real credibility factor. I think people know, okay, I spent enough time thinking about leadership to write a whole book about it. And so that's helped with my sales as well. But so as I, as I do continue to do a lot of motivational seeking, but I'm you know, trying to focus more on the on job path and veteran employment, but it's something I really enjoy doing. I uh, did it last week. I did it earlier this week. I have one coming up in two weeks. So they're going on all the time. I, I've done a lot and I really enjoy it. And I think, I think Corporate America wants to hear from our veterans. So it does take, a, this type of business does take a lot of hard work. Like every other industry, it is competitive. But just know if you're serious about it, there are resources. I'm a resource. I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to do this. But it does the same work. You can't just get up there and win. I, I think that's great. And the two things that kind of stick out to me is, um, one, I love that you're saying you did not quit your day job. And I think that when I talk to aspiring entrepreneurs, that's the one thing that always scares me is when they're like, yeah, I just quit my job or I'm going to quit my job. And I'm like, whoa, it takes so much time to build up revenue to keep a company alive, let alone to keep a company alive and pay your bills. And so what I respect about Justin's path here is he took the time to to build up the business, to let it grow, to give it breathing room, and then recognize, you know, okay, it's at a point now where I can jump off, which is is very great. And then I also love too, like the the, the small thing that he said in there was, you know, he was doing these speaking things. It sounds like um, he enjoyed them and he's good at it. And then he started to go to companies and started small and started to ask if they would pay him to do it. And that, that, you know, I know we're talking to a group of people who have been shot at and all these different things. It takes a lot of courage to reach out to someone you know or even don't know and ask them for money. That's like intimidating. And there's no way to build a business without it. And so I just want to call that out. I know it's just a small thing that Justin said. That takes a lot of courage. And it's so necessary to be able to bring any idea to life and to, to, to take a passion and turn it into an actual business. Yeah, in the military, we never, our pay is never an issue. You can look online, you know, everyone gets paid. You don't, you know, you're not sending someone an invoice. You have to get comfortable 
saying what and defining what you're worth. Like when I talk to a corporate audience now, the typical fee is fifteen thousand. I didn't start there, and and it's still to this day sounds odd saying this is what it, this is what it costs. But you have to say it and let it let it sit there, not immediately start backtracking for that number because that number is not based on that one just that one hour that I'm in front of the audience. It's based on my 16 years in the Marine Corps and everything I've done since then and overcoming an injury and writing a book and refining my message and tailoring it for them. So that's money well spent on their end. It's not something we're used to in the military is defining our worth. You have to get used to it. That might mean saying it into a mirror 10 times uh, before your first call, but you have to get used to saying it. I love that. I know that's something I'm working on as well. And I've been out of the military for 10 years and it's like yeah. understanding your value and not being ashamed about that. And I will tell you that the people in that audience, the people at that company who are hearing Justin's message and more importantly, seeing his example as an incredible human being, they are getting that times a thousand like they are getting a very strong return on that investment it is yeah. a win-win situation and i'll also point out that you know justin as you can tell between writing a book having a full-time job doing his own company he has a lot on his plate and so a lot of this too is him figuring out what are things worth for him and putting yeah. that out there without shame without fear without an edge and just saying this is you know this at this point in my life this is what it's worth to leverage my experience to do this if that works for you great if not great too and um and i also like that he said you know he ramped up to that it wasn't like uh hey i'm i think i'm the best thing in the world therefore i'm going to charge this right now it was a process he he built this up over time and i don't think there's any quick wins. I know that in a lot popular media, there's a lot of uh, yeah. portrayal of just kind of Instagram type success. And I think it's, you know, that's, that's not my experience and not the experience of people I've interviewed. It takes doing the homework, doing the work uh, and putting in time. And uh, Justin's clearly done that. So I think that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, I know that we're, we're out of time, but I always like to leave room at the end of, um, is there anything else that you'd want to share with listeners before we wrap up? Um, I guess I would just say, especially for those who are in transition, that just know that, uh, for instance, if you were to reach out to me and say, hey, Justin, can you send five minutes with me or 10 minutes with me? I would say yes. And I think every other veteran, just about every other veteran out there, if you're looking to, to apply for a job at, I don't know, Michaels or Hilton or, or USA or the Kenta, wherever it is, and you identify on LinkedIn, there's some veterans there and reach out to talk to them. They're going to probably take your call or answer over email. So don't be intimidated by the fact that you may not know someone personally. Have a friend introduce you or do it yourself. We want to take care of each other. This is why Scott and I, Scott Davis and I started the Veteran Success Resource Group. Uh, five years ago, which is now growing into Burbiz, helping veterans in a big way because we have to take care of our own. So don't be afraid to reach out. The other side of that coin is when someone does reach out to you, make sure you uh, spend a little bit of time with them, help them out because what comes around goes around and together we can all succeed. That's great. And I'll, I'll include links to veteran success resources and all of these different yeah. things. But um, Justin, thank you for your example in the military yeah, sure. community. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And thank you for speaking to the Beyond the Uniform listeners today. No, thank you for having me. Like I said, it's a real honor. Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with the help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, our Editor, Lex Brown, and our Head of Social Media, Janelle Hanf. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First of all, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 380 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of the men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second of all, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but just don't have nearly the resources to do it. If you know of a company that would advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them our way. 
third of all donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of our website. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find over 380 episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll also find both free and for purchase resources that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career in life.